Well, hello again, Mark from the Church of Christ that meets in Beaverton, Oregon. We're located at 11775 Southwest 5th in Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, we're on the World Wide Web, beaverinchurchofchrist.net. Our phone number, 503-644-9017. Services, Sunday, 9 for Bible study Sunday morning, 10 for a period of worship, 5.30 Sunday evening. And we have a midweek service, 7 o'clock Wednesday night, once again, Bible study for all ages. I want to talk about happiness. Um, I think everyone does want to be happy, and while there's an element of truth in what Emerson said, that the purpose of life is not to be happy, but to be useful, honorable, compassionate, to have made some difference that you've lived and lived well. At the same time, it's true that the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit includes joy, Galatians chapter 5 and of verse 22. And God is looking for people who love life and want to see good days, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 where it says, for the one who desires life to love and see good days, and then it tells you how to go about seeing those good days. So it's very clear that we're not to neglect being useful or honorable or compassionate or having a good influence to grab some temporary happiness. But God wants us to be genuinely happy and want to talk about that in this particular lesson. There's a book written by Gretchen Rubin, The Happiness Project. It's an interesting read. And in that book, there's something that she wrote that really caught my attention. She said, the words of the writer Colette had haunted me for years. What a wonderful life I'd had. I only wished I'd realized it sooner. Then she says, I didn't want to look back at the end of my life after some great catastrophe and think how happy I used to be then, if I only realized it. Boy, I found myself thinking the very same thing. Because it's easy to kind of look back at a period of time in your life, a time that maybe you thought was overwhelming, or you thought was really busy, and to say, boy, I really didn't realize how good I had it then. I know a lot of people in a hurry, we're in a hurry to grow up, we're in a hurry not to be kids anymore, we're in a hurry to date, we're in a hurry not to be single. We're in, a, we're in a hurry to get done with our education. We're in a hurry to get a job. We're in a hurry to buy a house. We're in a hurry to get married. We're in a hurry to have kids. And then we're in a hurry for the kids to grow up. And then we're in a hurry for the kids to leave the house. We're in a hurry to retire. We're in a hurry to reach a point where money's not tight any longer. It just seems like we're always in a hurry. And along the way, it seems like it's very easy not to really enjoy life and not to enjoy just average, everyday days. And because those, most of the days that we get in life are your average, everyday type of day. Um, and so she said, she said, am I, am I wasting opportunities to experience joy in my life and failing to go, gr feel grateful for just an ordinary day in my Am I failing to, to really seize happiness where it is? Am I settling for an unnecessary low level of happiness? Is my level of happiness anything I can do anything about? And there are some people that say no. There are some people that say you're just kind of stuck. Uh, there's really nothing you can do about your level of happiness. It is really more pre-programmed, and you really can't change it at all. And yet, I don't agree with that, and I don't think Scripture agrees with that either. And other research, other research says, at least when it comes to happiness, that about 50% of that is genetic, is, is kind of the stuff you inherited. Then you got a percentage of it that is life circumstances, age, gender, ethnic, uh, what sort of ethnic group you're part of, marital status, income, health, occupation, and your, your religion account for about 10 to 20 percent of your happiness. And that means that, that at least 30 percent of it is up to us, pretty much purely up to us. And even in that list I gave you, quite a bit of that is still up to us as far as marital status or how happy our marriage is. We have, we have a huge say over how, how, how happy our marriage is. 
uh, our health. Some of that is up to us as far as have we taken good care of ourselves, do we exercise, do we get enough sleep, um, you know, or, or are we abusing our body? Uh, things like religion, whether or not we believe, that we have control over that. Um, occupation, how much money we make is something that a choice that we, we make in life. Uh, you know, uh, how, what sort of life do I want to live and how comfortable do I want to be it? How much time do I want to spend on homework at night? How hard do I want to work in school? And what do I do, want to do for a living? Th those are also a lot of choices that we have. One list I saw, one list I saw on habits, habits of happy people, making good friends, actively pursuing goals, doing what one is good at and often, giving, not chasing stuff, and living the life that one desires to live. Now, a list can be very useful. Benjamin Franklin designed his own list of virtues. It was a chart he came up with. And every day, every day, he would grade himself on whether he was working on each one of those virtues. And in his chart, he had the virtues of temperance, silence, order, resolution for godly, industry, sincerity, justice, temptation. Um, and um, those are things that he looked at, that he looked at on his particular list. And uh, moderation, cleanliness, maybe some people need that on their list, uh, tranquility, chastity, humility. And every day, as I said, he would score himself in that category. Many have found a chart like that to be very useful because that sort of chart reminds you on a daily basis of what you're aiming for. Uh, you know, if you don't focus on a target, you're not going to hit anything. If you don't aim, you're not going to hit anything. You focus on things you value, the person that you want to become, what you're trying to achieve. And in that list that Benjamin Franklin had, and in the list also I read previous to that, if those sound familiar, if they kind of have a familiar ring to them, um, it's probably because we've heard them maybe in Scripture before, thousands of years ago, that God has kind of given His own sort of things, that these are important things when it comes to happiness. I want to talk about making good friends, and the Bible actually helps us determine what a good friend really is, because I thought a lot of people are confused on what a good friend is. Um, you know, uh, someone says a good friend is someone who won't let you do a stupid thing alone. You know, or a good friend bails you out of jail, a best friend is in jail with you and say, man, what a, what a fun time we had. I see a lot of kind of superficial statements like that about friendship. And so the world at times really doesn't know, well, what would be a good friend? Unfortunately, sometimes the friends that some people want are nothing more than rubber stamps. I just want people around me rubber stamping my decisions. I want people around me agreeing with everything I do, backing me up on everything I do. I don't want anyone correcting me. I don't want anyone giving me any constructive criticism. Uh, and, and that's sometimes that's the friendships that people want, just a bunch of rubber stamps around you. I think the Bible speaks of that in Proverbs 18, 24, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. And then it says, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, which means that the friends of the too many friends category are, are superficial friends. They, they're friends that, that bail on you when things get rough. They are friends that don't correct you when you're about to do something really dangerous. They're friends that don't bring out the best in you. There are friends that don't uh, challenge you if you said something inappropriate and say, you know, I think you're better than that. Um, in the book of Proverbs 19 and verse 4, it says wealth adds many friends, but not of the real type of friends, but fair weather friends. In contrast to those passages, there are passages that actually talk about what I would call genuine friendship or truly good friends. Proverbs 27, verse 17 Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's the type of friends that we we're really we should be interested in. Um, now, those friends, friendships like that where iron sharpens iron, um, those type of friendships demand you grow up. They demand that you become an adult. They demand that you're honest. Um, they demand that you're willing to listen. 
they demand, that you're seeking wisdom. Uh, you know, if you want to remain dumb, you're not going to look for friends like that. Iron sharpens iron type of friendships are where you gain wisdom, character, inspiration, courage, purity, and in which those friendships in which those virtues are reinforced. Jesus said, greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. And hopefully those are the type of friends that we want to be, and those are the type of friends that we're looking for. So what is my attitude about friendship? Do I want to gather people in my life who will not hold me accountable, people not as gifted as myself, um, people not as smart as me, so I can kind of be the focus of the group and the leader of group? There are people that want that. There are people that want to be kind of the king of the hill in the group, and so they surround themselves with people that they feel are below them. Or do I want to surround myself with people that I, that I want to learn from? I, I want to surround myself with smart people and people that are mature and people that have great character, people that I can learn from, people that bring out the best in me. Those are the friendships I want. Uh, beware, beware. Uh, taking the life of the loner, taking the life of the loner, I don't need anybody in my life. You, you're not, you're not going to arrive at happiness. I, I typically find that people that have taken that loner route end up bitter, end up resenting things, end up angry, end up doing a lot of complaining and grumbling how things have not went their way or that, you know, they don't have any luck and that sort of thing. Um, the benefit of good friends is if you start going down that road of good friends around you, as well as me, if you, if, you start, if you start throwing a pity party for yourself when you have good friends, they're going to call you on it. They're going to remind you of your blessings. Uh, if you start complaining about the marriage you're in, they're going to call you on that and remind you how good your husband or wife is or how great your life is. Uh, they're going to call you on that. Uh, if you're about ready to make a hasty decision, they will call you on that and say, wait a minute, have you thought that through? If, 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 if you're thinking about going to college and, 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 taking, and getting an easy degree, they're going to call you on that and say, don't you realize, yeah, yeah, that's an easier degree to get, but there's no jobs. It doesn't pay anything. They're, they're going to challenge you on those sort of things, and those are the type of friends that you really want around. Because if, when you don't have friends like that around you, when you put all those type of people at arm's length, like, hey, if you don't like the choice I'm making, I don't want to hear it, okay? Well, then you're going to end up making some bad choices. And as a result, your life is going to not be that enjoyable. The next thing, actively pursuing gratitude. Now, the Bible speaks of that a lot. It's interesting, in the book of Colossians chapter 3, there are, there's like three passages, two or three passages, and in each passage, the same word shows up, thanks or thankfulness. First of all, it says in um, 315, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Next verse. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Gratitude, 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 gratitude. Philippians 4, 6 says, But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And 1 Timothy 2, 1 says, First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. It, to me, it makes sense how being actively expressing your gratitude is tied in with happiness because people that actively express their gratitude remind themselves of how good their life is. They remind themselves that, hey, I've got, I've got blessings in my life. There are good things in my life. There are people that really care about me in my life. Also, we need to be wise about what we count as a blessing. If something, comes us, if something comes into our life and it is fun and pleasurable, but it moves us away from God, it's not a blessing. 
If something comes into our life and it's uncomfortable and challenging or maybe even painful, but it moves us to God, then it is a blessing and we need to be grateful for that. Also, we need to not forget just daily blessings, the small things throughout the day. Thank God for all of them. And Paul told Timothy, pray and express gratitude for all men. Um, it's easy to take people for granted, especially people that you see every day. We need to openly and consistently communicate to people, whether it's the spouse we see every day, I'm so grateful you're in my life, whether it's parents, whether it's children, love you so much, mom and dad, thanks for being good parents, whether it's fellow Christians, I couldn't, you know, thanks for your encouragement. Or whether it's people like, hey, the doctor, the nurses, thanks for taking care of my mom. Thanks for taking care of my brother. The neighbors, thanks for helping out my parents, that sort of thing. Just all the people that we benefit from on a daily basis. Then actively pursue goals, and I think the key word there is the word actively. Many people do a lot of day daydreaming and dreaming and fantasizing and talking about goals that they never actively take any steps to achieve, to make them true. Well, what goals are wise? What goals are worth our time? Because Paul, Paul warned us about goals that are dead ends. He, he says those that want to get rich or those that want to get rich quick or want to get rich at all costs they fall into a lot of trouble, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. You know, each day of our lives, we need to realize that we're actually working towards a goal each day of our lives. It can be a worthy goal or an unworthy goal, but every day we work on it. Every day, bit by bit, we are working on either creating for ourselves a happy future or a future that's not going to be very happy where we're undermining the possibility of a happy future. I've also found that people that do not actively pursue wise goals, they end up feeling sorry for themselves. They end up envious of people that have achieved their goals. They end up regretting the past. They end up blaming their failures or lack of starting on other people. Well, I would have done that one day, but no one ever gave me encouragement or whatever, things like that. Um, and they tend to hang out with other people that are in the same boat they are, that are equally complaining. And people that do not actively pursue goals, wise goals, good goals, um, seek to take shortcuts. They play the lottery. Well, you know what? I, I didn't save as I should have. I wasn't wise about my money. Maybe I can win a whole bunch of money. Um, they attempt shortcuts. Then, you know, I'm not out there working on a relationship. I'm not out there being the man I need to be. And so I'm just going to jump from one superficial girlfriend relationship to another. I'm not willing to take the time to really invest in the person, be the type of man I need to be, uh, create a marriage together and, and, and work together and, and change things about myself that I need to change. Not willing to do that. Too much work. Uh, I, I'd rather just, I'd rather either have a, have a girlfriend on the internet or just some sort of really superficial relationship. Do what you're good at and do it often. Now, now the Bible would agree with that. On the one hand, the Bible would say, absolutely yes, use your talents. And that's Romans chapter 12, that uh, each one of us has different talents or gifts. It doesn't mean we're good at them right away. Okay, that doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we're just born a public speaker. Uh, doesn't mean necessarily that we're just born knowing math really well. And, and that, that, that's one of those things I think a lot of people just quit too soon. I know when I was young, I thought, hey, if I'm in an algebra class and I don't get the lesson the first time, well, that means I'm no good at math. And that is so untrue. Uh, you talk to anyone who is good at math and it's taken a lot of work. You talk to anyone who's a doctor, a dentist, or et cetera. Talk to an engineer. You talk to anybody like that and ask them, did it just come easily? And they will say, absolutely not. It took a lot of work. Years ago, I, I remember hearing a, a someone approach a preacher after hearing him give a lesson and say, man, 
I give 30 years, I give 30 years of my life to know the Bible the way you do. And he said, that's exactly what it took. It took 30 years of my life. But there are so many people that want some sort of quick, instant shortcut. So do what you're good at. Do it often. Absolutely, yes. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, where it says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And then it says, if service, in a service. Good at service, then serve. Or he who teaches, yeah, you need to be teaching then. So exercise it often. Now, I'm going to add something else there. And that is, there's more to this than just whatever you're good at, do it often. Is whatever you're good at, use it wisely. There are people that are great public speakers, but don't always use it wisely. I mean, the kingdom of God needs good public speakers. Uh, the church needs good teachers. Whatever talent you have, make sure God gets some of that talent. Just don't use it for yourself or some earthly cause that's going to end when you die and really have no other meaning beyond that. If you're a people person, yeah, don't just exercise that in some secular club, but exercise that in seeking to tell people about God as well. Now, there may be things that you think you're no good at. At least try it. At least try it. Work on that. See if there is a talent there. Expand your abilities. Do other things. Be willing to try new things. Appreciate and give encouragement to those who are more skilled than you are in either your area or another area. Don't be envious. Be grateful there's talented people in this world. Giving. The Bible often talks about generosity, like Proverbs 11, 25. The generous soul or the generous man will be made rich, and he who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 22, verse 9. He who has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. Acts 20, verse 35. Paul said, Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For the same measure or with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, in this life, we have a choice to be either a giver or a taker, and I would put it giver, God, taker, Satan. Satan's a taker. God's a giver. On the one hand, on the one hand, a taker is, I want it my way. A taker is, I will only do something for you if you do something for me. A taker is, how can I use you as a stepping stone? How can I use you as just a rung in a ladder to step on and climb on to get ahead? Or a taker says, I will be your friend as long as you are useful to me, as long as there's some advantage to me. Or a taker says, I don't get anything out of going to church or helping people or whatever. I don't get anything out of that. A taker says, how does this make me look? A taker says, I, you know, before I hang out with those people, how's that going to make me look? Is that going to diminish my popularity or increase my popularity? If hanging out with those people increases my popularity, then I'll hang out with them. And a taker says, whatever it takes to be popular. I will compromise. I will do whatever it takes to be popular to fit in. That's a taker. A giver, a giver says, I want to do the right thing, even if I don't get my way. Like in a marriage, like in a marriage. Hey, as a husband, I want to do the right thing, even if that means I don't get my way in this particular circumstance. A giver says, I will help you, and I don't, respect, I don't expect anything in return, and I don't keep score. A taker keeps score. You know, that's the second time I've helped you, or whatever. That's what a taker does. A taker is taking, keeping score of all the things. Let me say it this way. A taker only keeps a partial score. A taker keeps score of all the things it has done for other people, and completely forgets all the things other people have done for it. Here's the way a giver keeps score. A giver pretty much forgets about 
what it does for other people, and it remembers what other people have done for it. Difference between a taker and a giver. A giver says, how can I help you? A giver, a giver comes prepared to Bible study or worship to offer something positive. A giver doesn't come with, well, what are you going to do for me and how are you going to make me feel? A giver comes prepared. I'm prepared to sing. I'm prepared to contemplate. I'm prepared to pray. I'm prepared to make comments in class, good comments. A giver says, I want God to be glorified. A taker says, I want to get the credit. I want people to see me. A giver says, whatever it takes to be good. Giver refuses to compromise. Whatever it takes to be good. You know, Jesus long ago taught that the mindset behind a taker will prevent the taker from ever finding real happiness. And I just, I've lived long enough to see takers taken. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the guy that's, you know, cheated on his wife, left his wife, got involved with a woman only for that woman to cheat on him. Takers often get taken. Someone who's kind of shady in their business dealings and takes advantage of other people often eventually gets taken advantage. Takers often get taken in this world. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, 20, 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And that is, if I'm going to hang on to my life and, and I'm not going to give and I'm going to do everything for me and, and I'm going to make sure, hey, I'm going to make sure I'm taken care of and all of that, blah, 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 okay? You know, I'm not going to share, not going to share, etc. Going to keep it all for me. Well, he says, hey, that, that person doesn't find happiness. But then it says that whoever loses his life for my sake says, hey, here's my life. I'm going to give it for God. I'm, I'm going to use my life to serve others. And hey, I, I'm just going to open up my life and help other people. That person finds life. I, I typically find that the person that's a taker their world becomes smaller and smaller and smaller as they're trying to huddle around all their stuff. And actually, they probably off, their, their stuff kind of shrinks. I find that often the giver who says, hey, you need to use my trailer? Sure, you need to use this. Hey, you need help moving? I'll come and help you move. That person actually, if they want, they could have more stuff. Finally, of course, part of the chart was, you know, don't chase stuff. Don't chase stuff, and the Bible clearly talks about that. Don't put your hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But how about living the life you want? Now, living the life you want, you might say, well, that doesn't sound like a very Christian thing, living the life you want. Aren't we supposed to live for God? You're tr that's right. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, we're to live for Jesus. Living the life you want could be a very selfish thing. Okay. In fact, I think a lot of people that are not Christians and not believers, would probably argue that they're living the life they want. I'm going to disagree with that. I'm going to disagree that the person out here that is just ignoring God and doing what and kind of living for self, I'm going to challenge that. I'm going to challenge them. I really don't think that they're living the life they want. Because that person is claiming I'm free. And, and, and I'm not going to go against Jesus. Jesus said everyone who commits sin is a servant or slave of sin. John chapter 8, you know, 34 through 36. Um, then there's another passage, Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world. That says that non-Christians are conformed to this world. That is, they're not free. They are conforming to a certain pattern or mold. They're allowing the world to kind of squeeze them into a, a mold. Then I think of Proverbs 29, 25, the, the fear of man brings a snare. And when I put those passages together, that's why I say the person out there who says, well, you're a Christian and you're, you're bound by those rules and etc. and you're following God and have to do what he says. I'm not a Christian and I'm free. And I'm living the life I want. And I, I'm, I'm going to challenge that. I don't think you are. I think you're just fooling yourselves. Because I see so many people of the, I'm the living the life I want mentality out in the world who are 
conforming. That is, they're people who are bound by human rules. They're bound by political correctness. I hear it on talk shows. I hear sports shows, etc. I see it in editorials. They're bound by political correctness. They're bound by popularity. They're bound by quirky family codes and rules. They're bound by either secular or religious traditions. And, they, 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 and they're bound by the praise of men. They're bound by the desire to be popular. They're bound by the fear of men. Um, I don't think they're free. I don't think they're living the life that they want to live. I think they're living the life that everybody else wants them to live and are afraid to say or do anything um, that would make them stand out like a sore thumb. And so they're not going to stand out. They're just going to, hey, where's the flow? Stick my finger up in the air and the broad way, and I'm going to go with the crowd because, boy, if I kind of step away from that and say, you know what, I disagree with that, and you're, 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 people are going to say, ah, oh, you're this or you're that. By contrast, I believe that when I live the Christian life, I'm actually living the life that I want to live. Because what do I want? What, what, do, what, do you, what, do we, what do you really want for yourself? Well, here's a list. I want to be a good spouse. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father. Does anyone want to be a lousy father? Anybody out there want to be a... I want to be a lousy husband. That's my goal in life. Really? Anyone want to be a lousy father? Anyone want to be a horrible grandparent? I don't think so. I want to be a good neighbor. Anyone want to be a bad neighbor? I want to be a good friend. Anyone want to be a bad friend? I want to be a good citizen. Anyone want to be a really bad citizen or a pitiful citizen? I want to be good and courageous. Anyone want to be a coward? Okay. I want to be kind. Does anyone really want to be cruel? I want to be patient. Is it any fun being impatient? And so that's why I said everything that, everything that Jesus offers me leads to really me living the life I, I really want to live, the life that is best for me. That is, to be a good person, be a good father, be a good mother, be a good citizen, be a good neighbor, and to be courageous and honest and honorable and kind and compassionate. Being a Christian helps me become all of those things. Not being a Christian steers me away from all of those things. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about happiness in, in more lessons. That's just kind of an introduction of this particular lesson on happiness. If you've got any questions, my name is Mark. I'm with the Church of Christ in Beaverton. You can always call me, 503-644-9017. If I'm not in the office, leave me a phone number. I'll call you back and get a hold of you. If you'd like to get together for a home Bible study, I'd love to come into your home and we could talk about this. We could talk about any questions you have. You know, are, are you, are you, are, do you have some questions about God's existence? Is the Bible the Word of God? Was Jesus raised from the dead? What do you do to be saved? How do you resist temptation? How do you believe in God, a God you can't see? Why do innocent people suffer? On and on and on. Hey, Bible answer for a Bible question. I'm here. I'm available. I've got some time on my schedule. I do have time to meet with you at your convenience, at where, a place that you would like to meet. You, you could bring family and friends. We can open up the Bible, and you could start on the path of um, improving your life and, and, and a life lived with meaning and purpose. Again, you, you don't have to settle for a second-rate life. You don't have to settle for second death. You just have to say, well... I guess things just haven't worked out for me. You know, no, no one, you don't get rewarded at the end of the day for complaining. Uh, you know, you just don't. Well, I guess I'm just going to sit back here and never, stuff didn't go my way and I'm really not getting what I want. You're not rewarded for that attitude. I mean, God's not going to come up later and say, oh, you know, you, you didn't push yourself. Oh, um, you let other people discourage you here. Um, let's, let's give you a, a, a better life again. That's not the way it works. I mean, no, one, no one's going to be clapping for you at the end of the day if you just kind of have this, well, you know, I guess happiness is for other people, but it's not for me. No one's clapping. No one's saying, yay. Um, 
No one, you don't get rewarded for that attitude, okay? So would you like to improve your life? Would you like to really find God wants you to have great blessings? I'm here to help you out. My name is Mark. I'm with the Church of Christ in Beaverton, 503-644-9017. You can see us on the World Wide Web. This lesson will be posted on the web, or you can print it off and read it for yourself, beatermoonchurchofchrist.net. Sunday morning services, 9 a.m. Bible study, all ages, 10 o'clock for worship, 5.30 Sunday evening, and 7 o'clock Wednesday night, midweek. To be saved, to become a Christian, hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, John 3, 16. Repent of your sins, Acts 2, 38. Confess Jesus as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Be baptized and immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you need any help, if you'd like to schedule a time to be baptized, if you'd like to schedule a time to get together and talk about these things, my name is Mark, 503-644-919017, Beaverton Church of Christ. Until next time, we'll see you later.